Good morning, everyone. We all doing well today? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We're in a house of miracles. Do we believe that? Right? We sing that song that God moves, that God works, and God acts, and he wants to do that today as he speaks to us through his word. If you're online with us today, we want to also say welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. You're a part of the church family, and even though you're not here in person, you're still part of the family, and we're thrilled to have you with us. So, true story here, 62-year-old Timothy J. Bowers couldn't find himself a job. He had no retirement saved, and he had nobody that left him any sort of inheritance. And so, with no guarantee for his future, he came up with a financial plan to get him through the next three years until he could collect Social Security. So he walks into a bank, he hands the teller a note and tells him, I'm here to rob the bank, I want $80. The, tail, the teller uh, gave him the $80 and then you know, pressed the silent alarm. Bowers then walked over to the security guard who was standing in the lobby and told him he just robbed the bank. Uh, uh, they arrested him and he went before the judge and he told the judge he was all good with a three-year sentence and the judge obliged. <laughs> Prosecutor Dan Cable was quoted as saying this, it's not the financial plan I would choose, but it is a financial plan. Well, as we dive today back into the book of Ephesians, we discover that there is this guaranteed inheritance for us who are believers in Jesus Christ. And this guarantee gives us a plan that we can live our lives on and build our lives on until we receive that inheritance. So I'd like you, if you have a physical Bible, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter one. If you're on your phones, you can go to the YouVersion Bible app track along with us there. And we're going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, and we're going to start there. And notice what it says. It says this, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, Paul's a Jew, so he's writing this. He says, God's purpose is that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, you Ephesians, now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. One translation says, you are marked with a seal by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee. Say guarantee. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased for us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The Apostle Paul tells us that those who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they received this incredible gift, this amazing gift. He gave us the Holy Spirit. You were sealed, he says, with the Holy Spirit. You were identified, it says, as his own. Now, what does this even mean? Well, in the first century, goods would be shipped from one place to another. And when they were shipped, they were sealed. Now remember, Ephesus is a port city. And so it's the link, if you will, from the, between the east and the west. And one of the industries there in Ephesus, they had a huge booming logging industry. And so logs were brought down from the Caspian Sea, made their way to Ephesus, and that was kind of the the distribution hub by which the logs went out to the rest of the world. So these merchants, they would would examine the, the different logs, and they would choose and select their logs. And once they had picked the logs that they wanted, they would then cut out a wedge from the log, and each person cut out a unique wedge which indicated these are, our, these are my logs, I've selected these logs. That wedge was called a seal. Now, 
Uh, we're also familiar with another type of seal in the first century. You've probably heard of this type, where merchants, kings, and business owners, and others, they would take wax, they would melt the wax, and then if there was a document, they would fold it and seal the document up, and they would pour the wax onto the document or on a container full of goods. They would then take their signet ring that was unique to them alone, they would press that into the wax, thus sealing the document or container. That was a seal. It was a unique mark of ownership because only you had that specific particular signet ring. You know, we do the same today, don't we? Uh, if, if we have, you know, a book or maybe our Bible, we might write our name in it. If you have kids and they're heading off to camp, right, you're writing their names in, in their clothes because you want to make sure you get back your clothes and, 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 you know, parents can call each other and swap back clothes, you know, make sure everybody has the right ones. Ranchers will brand their cattle. We do this. We place a mark to show ownership. You and I, Paul says, we are sealed with God's unique mark that God has put his ID tag on us as a mark of ownership that we are his. Now, what else does it mean to actually be sealed? Well, whenever a letter or a container was sent by an individual, again, whether it's a king or a merchant or a, or a business owner, the person who actually did the transporting of that letter or that container that person carried the authority of the sender. In a similar way, because you and I have been sealed with, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, that means we carry the authority of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? He said, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Why? Why can we do the things that Jesus did and even greater things? Why? Because we have the authority in our lives through the power of the Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says, God didn't give you and I a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of what? What does it say? A spirit of? A spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. Here's the question. Do you live your life as if you actually have the authority of Jesus in your life? Do you live in such a way that you have the authority of Jesus Christ in your circumstances, in your situations that come across you, that you tap into God's Holy Spirit power that can work in you and through you? He's available to you. Ephesians says, Ephesians verse 19, chapter 1 says, you have this power. It's there. It's available to us. And God is saying, the Apostle Paul is saying, tap into that power. Tap into that power. He will give you, how can you do that? He's going to give you victory to overcome temptation. He's going to give you the power to overcome that temptation. He's going to give you the courage to share the gospel. He is going to give you with that power a tender heart to love and care for people who don't look like you, think like you, act like you, or vote like you. He's going to give you this, this power that is going to give you a humility, a humility to be able to say those words that are so hard to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I messed up. He will give you that power. The question is, will you take advantage of it? The power is there if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It is inside of you. You've been sealed with God by the Holy Spirit. He is God's mark that you are his. Now, why does he do this beyond the fact that he will give us his power? Well, we also see another reason God seals us. Let's go back to the verses. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll pick up in verse 13 again. Notice he says this. He says, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. Again, the NIV says you are marked with a seal by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago the Spirit is God's guarantee. Another translation says it's God's deposit that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. To put it another way, the Holy Spirit is this incredibly huge down payment, a deposit from God in your life to remind you and I that God means what he says and he says what he means. That God is a God who will fulfill his promises. That God's word says that if you are a Jesus follower, that when you die, what happens? You receive our inheritance. The inheritance promised to us that we are ushered into eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians says it this way. 
that when we're absent from this body, we are present with the Lord. And this heaven, this inheritance that we have for us is beyond our wildest dreams. It's a greater inheritance than we could ever receive here on earth. It's greater than we can possibly imagine. And to give us the assurance of this inheritance, God says, I'm giving you a huge, huge down payment. I'm placing the Holy Spirit in your life. That's your guarantee. That's your guarantee that you have the promise of heaven. I mentioned the logging industry that, in Ephesus, and when a merchant would purchase the logs, they put down a down payment onto those logs. That was their guarantee that if the logs were delivered to the proper place, that was the guarantee that they would pay the balance. They would pay the rest of the money. When Heather and I moved to Elk Grove in 2002, we were looking for a new home. And so we were praying about this, and we were praying specifically, like, God, we were really praying that you would provide us with a, with a new home with a sing, that's a single story that, that uh, will be on a cul-de-sac, and there will be room for, uh, on the side for a boat or, or an RV, that there'd be, you know, boat stores that we could have. Well, when we, at the time when we moved to Elk Grove, they were building a lot of new homes south of Elk Grove Boulevard, and, and, and as we're going to these new homes, and, and it's just kind of a frenzy at that time in late 2002, and people are just snagging up and snatching up every single house the second they came up, and, and we just couldn't find a single story in a cul-de-sac that had room for, for a boat, and we just kept praying, oh, come on, God, provide us something, so we're driving around, and we go to these houses, uh, or these models, um, that were just south of Velcro Boulevard in Bruceville, kind of behind the coal shopping center. There were the new, new homes going right there, and, and we walked into the first model, and when you walk into the first model, you walk in there, and there's this big, giant, you know, board, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? And on the board, it has the layout of, of all of the lots and the houses, and there's, there's two little chips that are on that board, and one is red that says on top of it what? Sold. The other's green that says, I don't know, avail or something like that. Available, right? And so I quickly scan over this thing and I look and I notice, oh, there's a court. Oh, and I see on the court, there's a green that says avail. Everybody, everything else was, you know, sold, sold, sold. And I saw this green. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I, and I, and I, I try to grab the, the, the salesperson. I say, hey, by any chance, is there room for a boat on that lot? They said, yes, there is. I said, sweet. And so I, I ran, I literally ran out. Um, I was like, what model is it? She's like, three. And I run out and I run down to Model three. I step in through the front door. I step about five, six, seven steps in. I look around. I'm like, this will do. <laughs> this couple had just walked out of the house and were walking quickly back to the models. Again, houses are going quick. And I walk, run out of that house like George Costanza with the fire, you know, and I'm shoving people out of the way and run in. I take my check, I slap it down, and I said, sold. We'll take the lot. I do feel bad for that family. If you're here and we took your house. <laughs> I tell Heather, we got, our, our, we got our lot, our house, and she's like, I haven't even seen it. I said, don't worry, I haven't either, but it'll be fine. We have room for our boat. <laughs> that check that we gave them was our deposit. It was our guarantee that we would buy that home, that it would be ours. You see, God says, I am going to give you this incredible home, this incredible inheritance. First Peter chapter 1 describes it this way. We have been born into a new life, which has an inheritance that can't be destroyed or corrupted and can't fade away. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Jesus says it's a, it's a mansion with many rooms. That, that Jesus says, I'm going to give you heaven. It's the best home. It's better than some you know, single story in Elk Grove on a cul-de-sac with, with a room for a boat. It's far better than that. You have eternity in this home waiting for you. And if you ever doubt, if you ever lose heart, just remember we have this ceiling, this down payment called the Holy Spirit, which promises us and guarantees that that inheritance is ours and it is waiting for us. Now listen, I understand you and I, it can be easy for us to minimize the Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we talk about God the Father, the loving Father. We talk about God the Father all the time. We talk about Jesus the Son, our Savior who died so we can live. We talk about him all the time. But what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is an equal part of this triune God, and the Spirit in us is our assurance. 
It's our guarantee that our future is secure and secured, that we're in the family of God and that we will see God and the rest of his family in heaven one day. Now I know, I get it, I understand. There are times when we wonder, man, God, am I really saved? I mean, I know I have the Holy Spirit, but but am I really saved? Am I really a child of God? You've probably wrestled with that at some point in your walk with Christ, and that's okay to wrestle with that. And and when we wonder that, I I think it's a great question, but I think it's beautifully illustrated uh, in the story that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. Let me tell you a little bit about it. You might know the story. Jesus tells the story of of a young man who goes to his father and asks for his inheritance, which was really an insult to the father and the family. You're basically saying you want to, you know, kind of walk away from the family and go do life your own way. So he left the ranch to it with his inheritance to go off and to live his life in a way differently than the family desired and had for him. Jesus in the parable says that this person went off and squandered all of his money, all of his inheritance, Now, broke and destitute, the only job that he could find was feeding pigs. Which again, this was a a, a story told to Jewish people. Pigs aren't kosher, so this is the ultimate insult, if you will, that this shows us in the story how far he had wandered from his family and what they desired for his life and the life that he could have. Well, he comes to his senses and he realizes, oh my goodness, what have I been doing? I, I'm here working with pigs. Man, I'm gonna go back to my father, but I'm, you know, hopefully he's not angry, angry, so angry with me that I can't go back and I won't ask to be his son. I blew it. I'm not gonna ask to be his son. I'll just ask to be one of his hired hands, one of his slaves, and, and hopefully he's not so angry that I can at least work for him. Now, the story goes on, and Jesus is talking about this, and then it tells us about the father. The father, what was he doing every day? He was out there on the edge of the property every day, waiting, hoping, waiting and hoping that his son would return. And when the son returned, what did the father say? Did the father look at him and said, get out of here, get away, I'm so angry with you, I'm so upset, you're not welcome here, you're unwanted, so leave. Is that what the father said? No, if you know the story. This father said, my son is home. The son of, he is my son, my son who was lost, has now been found. You will be totally restored, not as a slave, but as my son. In other words, he was still a son, and nothing he did could change that truth. I don't know about you, but I praise God that God doesn't kick me out of his kingdom every time I screw up. Right, I, I praise God that it's not like, okay, that was not a good day with the Lord. I, I wasn't walking with the Lord today. Boom, you're out, you're no inheritance, you're gone. Oh, hey, today was pretty decent. Okay, I can stick in the kingdom. Up oh, today, messed up again, thought this, said this, did this. No, you're out of the kingdom. I praise God that's not how it works. The fact that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in our lives in spite of our sin, in spite of our screw-ups, that reminds us we're God's children. Now, Was he a prodigal? Yes. Did he blow it? Yes. Was he an embarrassment to his family? Sure. But he still was a son of the father, of a loving father who was thrilled to welcome him home. Now, here's something for us to think about. If you're a son, you will always come back. But if you're a pig, you won't. If you're a son, you'll always come back. If you're a pig, you won't. You know the story of the prodigal son. We just, told, we just told that he was living with the pigs, but he was the son, the prodigal son, and returned home. But what about the story of the prodigal pig? We, we see in 2 Peter chapter 2, it says this in verse 21. It says, talking of these individuals, it said, it'd be better if they had never known the way of righteousness. They, they had learned about the righteousness of God. It'd be better if they hadn't known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb, a dog returns to its vomit, and another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. I don't know about you, but I've actually personally witnessed a dog returning to its vomit. Right? Has that, have you experienced that? Have you seen that? Raise your hand if you've seen it. So some of you, okay, a whole bunch of y'all, you dog lovers, right? I got to tell you, it's not a pretty sight. 
And so when I hear people tell me, you know, a dog's mouth, you know, why do you let a dog lick your face? Well, you know, a dog's mouth is cleaner than a, a human's mouth. I'm like, yeah, you're nuts. Your dog's sticking his mouth in the toilet bowl, you know, going, oh, it's blue water, sweet, mouthwash, right? And then you're letting it lick your face. No, no, no. The proverb says a dog returns to its vomit. Now, why does it do that? Why does a dog return? Simple. It's its nature. It's a dog. That's what dogs do. It's the same with a pig. You can clean a pig all you want. You can make it nice and squeaky clean. But guess what happens? I guarantee you that pig will return to the mud. Why? Because it's a pig. It's its nature to roll around and play in the mud. Here's the point. If you're a prodigal, you'll always come home. But if you're a pig, you won't. If you're a prodigal, you will always come home. If you're a pig, you won't. In other words, a true Jesus follower, you you might go through a rough season. You might go through a rough patch in your faith. You might even go through a season where you are stumbling spiritually, maybe even wandering from your faith. But you always come back to the Father. And if you don't come back, then you weren't a true believer in the first place. See, what is it that that causes a child of God to return? Why does the prodigal come home? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's seal. The Holy Spirit is is God's seal on us. And and, and the Holy Spirit works in, in many different ways. The Holy Spirit's like this warning system that points out the dangers in the path we're pursuing and the direction we're going that's contrary to the life that God has for us. And it's God's spirit that is speaking to us. And God's word says it's convicting us of our sin. It's teaching us. It's reminding us. He's guiding us back to his truth. And by the way, this is one of the reasons it is so important to be in God's word on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to be soaking up God's word. Why? So that we can hear the Holy Spirit nudging us, calling us back to to a loving Father, nudging us and calling us back to what God has for us. You know, the Holy Spirit will nudge us, but the Holy Spirit will also shout at us. What do I mean by that? Well, the the Holy Spirit's kind of like the fire alarms that we have in our homes, Man, when those go off, have you experienced this? They are loud, ear-piercing, irritating. It's why I disconnected all of ours. Uh, You know, you're like, yeah, change the batteries. It didn't seem to work. Now, what's the purpose of those those irritating, piercing sounds coming out of your fire alarms? It's to point out a, a problem, right? That there's smoke, that there's fire. And I'll tell you this. The, that beats, those annoying sounds, those beeping that goes off, that beats the alternative of the house burning down. The Holy Spirit is that piercing alarm inside of us. And yeah, there's times when he can make things painful for us. And there's times where it can be really uncomfortable for us. But it's better than the alternative of reaping the consequences of wandering from God, of suffering consequences of sin. And so listen, the next time, the next time you are headed down the wrong path, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, when you sense that there's some pain, when you sense there's an alarm going off inside of you, just remember, prodigals come home. Prodigals come home. That alarm going off is God assuring you you're his child. That pain that you're experiencing is God assuring you, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And it just might mean that God is trying to get your attention to help you grow. Why? Because it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, as you endure his divine discipline, say discipline, as you endure this discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means then that you're illegitimate and that you're not actually his child after all. Verse 10 then says God disciplines, 
God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's what? Say it out loud. It's, man, it's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way and for those who are disciplined by the Lord. Heather and I have two sons and one daughter. And when they were young, especially, because we loved them, because they were our children, we disciplined them. And that's hard. And, 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 and I can remember when they were really young and Heather and I would talk and we would discipline them in such a way that like, we would walk away and it was so hard for us to do it and, and to stand firm and to, to make these decisions because and, and, it would just be easier to kind of let it slide. We are like, no, we need to discipline them because we know it will pay off. It will produce a harvest of right living. So as parents, we would discipline our children. You know what I didn't do? I didn't go out and discipline other people's children. There are times I really want to. Because I mean, I mean, some of these kids, I don't think they've ever been told no in their life. Right, right, you know what I'm talking about. But I don't discipline other people's children, why? Because it's not my privilege. It's not my right, they're not mine. God loves you. He loves you so much because you're his, he will discipline you. And it lets you know, even when it's painful. You know what? This is a great reminder. I'm going through the discipline of the Lord. It reminds me, I'm God's child. I'm his. He's my God. Why? Because I've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians says, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. So what's our response to this incredible news? Verse 14 goes on and says this. He says, he did this so that you and I would praise God and glorify him, that you and I would live this life reaching up to God, reaching out to God, glorifying him, praising him, lifting our life that I, my life, God, is not about me. It is all about bringing you glory because you and you alone are worthy and that you have given us this incredible inheritance and these incredible riches. And so, God, I will worship you and I will glorify you. And so I ask you, in what ways can you purposefully and intentionally glorify and worship God each and every day? Not just occasionally, not just on a Sunday, but what does it look like for you to purposefully, intentionally worship and glorify and praise God? But here's another question. Are there any fire alarms going off in your life right now? That irritating sound, maybe. And by the way, that irritating sound sometimes comes as a voice in our head, in our heart. It sometimes comes from somebody else or multiple people. That fire alarm going off in your life is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. He's convicting you. Are you listening? What steps will you take? Where are you not lined up with the will of God in your life? And the Holy Spirit's nudging you and speaking to you and saying, you know, that's what I've called you to. This is the life I have for you. Will you turn to me? Will you turn back to me? Will you surrender to me? See, some of you might be a prodigal here this morning. And God is, he's waiting on the, he's just waiting for you to return, to come back to him to return to him and and he welcomes you with open arms. Yeah, yeah, but all this sin I've done and I've squandered my life and I've wasted my I've wasted it all and I'm living with pigs. God will welcome your home. You're his child. Will you come back? Will you return to him? There are some here. I suspect you're not yet a child of God. You do not have this guaranteed this promise inheritance of eternal life. You don't have the Holy Spirit residing in you yet. And you might be thinking, well, what do I do? How do I get this guarantee, this Holy Spirit and this eternal life? Paul said this, Acts chapter two, he said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive this gift, this promised Holy Spirit. 
Would you like to know for sure where you would, will go when you die? Would you like to join the rest of us who have this assurance? To ha- would you like to have this guarantee? If so, I want to invite you right now to join me and pray and ask Jesus to come into your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you with open hearts and open hands. You are a good, good God. And for those of you who are Jesus followers and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, reminding you, maybe even disciplining you, if that's you, would you just say something like, God, I'm hearing you. And through your Holy Spirit, God, give me the courage to take the steps to follow your will for my life. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you would like the gift of eternal life, you would like this guarantee of knowing where you'll go when you die, if that's you and you say, I'm ready for that, I'm ready to embrace Jesus, if that's you, will you just pray with me right now? Pray something like this. Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this gift of eternal life. And thank you for offering me a guarantee that I will receive this inheritance. So Jesus, as best as I understand, right now I surrender my life to you. I'm gonna choose to no longer live for myself, but to live for you. My life is yours. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I surrender to you. Thank you for welcoming me in to your family. In Jesus' name I pray. God, hear these prayers as you welcome in more people into your family. We praise you, we worship you, we thank you for this gift of the Holy Spirit, this guarantee we will receive our inheritance and be with you one day. We worship you, Jesus, in your name.